well as any coach in football ever had. Mike Ditka, the fury and the passion. This man knows what inspires Mike Ditka. I think it's a burning desire um, to succeed, burning desire to be the best. As a player, uh, he had that fire. And I think that's carried over into his coaching style. It's a demonstrative coaching style, a style that drives and motivates his players. Mike Ditt has won a Super Bowl, but recent times have seen a strangely stoic sideline demeanor as the Bears have lost their last five games in a row. But Singletary recognizes that the Ditka fire still burns and that he won't keep it all to himself. If you can get people to feel the same intensity that you feel, the same desire, then I think you have something real special. The Chicago Bears face the Houston Oilers on ABC's Monday Night Football. You. I bet you're ready for some football. The Bears and the Oilers are coming your way. It's Monday Night Football and it's time to play. Houston, Texas, home of the Houston Oilers and also the home of the Astrodome. One of the more noisy venues in the National Football League. And the Dome will be rocking tonight as the Houston Oilers take on the Chicago Bears on Monday Night Football. Hello again, everyone. I'm Frank Gifford, along with Al Michaels and Dan Deardorff. Happy you're with us. Good one tonight. The Oilers and the Bears. An important game for these Houston Oilers. They are 7-5. and five. They trail the Pittsburgh Steelers in the Central Division of the AFC. The Steelers surprisingly at 10-3. and three. But the Oilers almost feel they must win tonight's game to stay atop the wild card picture. They'd like to play a game at home in the playoffs. First, they want to make it, but they would like to stay home. Meanwhile, we'll get in that a little later on, of course, with our guru of the playoff picture, Al Michaels. But Al, first, the Chicago Bears. They are 4-8 and eight coming into tonight. Their season is over for one of only two times, I think, in the history of Mike Ditka's storied coaching career that they've been out of the playoff picture. And this 1992 season has really taken on soap opera dimensions. Frank, they are looking ahead. They're looking to the future. First, what about the future of Mike Ditka? There's been rampant speculation. Will he resign? Will he get fired? Will he simply explode and self-destruct? He made it clear to us last night in no uncertain terms he intends to be back as the head coach of the Bears next year. Then he said we have to do some weeding and seeding. That process has already started. P.T. Willis starts tonight again at quarterback in place of Jim Harbaugh. Darren Lewis starts at running back in place of Neil Anderson. They'll revamp the offensive line. We'll get into that. And on the other side of the ball, the first thing they have to do is find a replacement for the retiring Mike Singletary. The schedule says this is their 13th game of 1992, but in another way, 1993 has already begun for the Bears. And Dan, while the Bears look to the future, clearly the Oilers are playing in the here and now. Yeah, they really are, Al. The weeding and seeding is over. It's time to harvest some crops here in Houston, and that means playoffs. And this is December. And if you want to make the playoffs, you better plan on winning 10 ball games. The Oilers have already won seven, which means they've got to win three out of their next four. Well, if you look at the remaining three, they have Green Bay, they have to go to Cleveland, then they're back home to play Buffalo, and all three of those teams have playoff aspirations of their own. So, if you want to make the playoffs, you've got to beat the teams you're supposed to beat. And the Oilers, their fans, and everybody in Houston expect them to beat the Bears tonight. Normally, that means trouble. This is only the sixth time since the merger in 1970 that these two teams have faced each other. Houston has won three of the prior five, and it's the third time the Bears have played in the Astrodome. Al Del Greco will kick off and back to receive for the Chicago Bears. Dennis Gentry, number 29, and Darren Lewis, who will start along with Brad Muster in the backfield as the running back. Dennis Gentry, good career average, 22.7 per return as Del Greco puts it in the air. It's a pretty short kick. It's taken at the 12-yard line by Darren Lewis, 
and he can bring it back only to the 19, but a flag is thrown at the end of the play. Scott Kozak makes a tackle, and we've already got our first scuffle. Glenn Kozlowski, the special team's maven of Chicago, number 88, who had been on injured reserve, was activated last week, involved, and the penalty is against the Bears, so that's going to push him back half the distance. So a flag on the run back. The referee tonight is Dale Hamer. And Chicago will start from deep in its own territory. Holding number 88 on the return. Half the distance to the goal. First down. So for Kozlowski, he gets into a fight or into a scuffle anyway at the beginning and his flag. Peter Tom Willis out of Florida State started last week had good stats in the game against Cleveland but threw a very harmful interception early on and they lost to the Browns. Lewis and Muster, the running back. Davis and Morgan in the wideouts. Jennings the tight end. We'll get to the interior lineman in a moment as Willis hands the ball to Lewis. And Lewis takes it out to the 14-yard line. A gain of five. It'll be second and five. Now up front, for the moment, Orzine starting at left tackle, and he is part of their future as well. Bortz, Fontenot, Thayer, and Van Horn, some familiar names, but as we mentioned at the top, eventually Dick is going to revamp the line, and Dan will get into that shortly. Fuller, Childress, Alman Jones up front. We'll also see a lot of Lee Williams. Graff, spelling the injured Lathan. Smith in the middle, Robinson, a rookie out of Alabama State. Chris Dishman and the former Ram, Jerry Gray at the corners. Bubba McDowell and Marcus Robertson are the safeties. Second and five at the 14-yard line. And this is Lewis again, and Lewis is out to the 20-yard line, and it should be enough for a first down. Al Smith makes the tackle. Darren Lewis, the all-time leading ground gainer in the history of the Southwest Conference, went to Texas A&M. Big story already tonight, Greg Landry, who's normally on the sideline, the offensive coordinator, and calls the plays, and he stands next to Mike Ditka, is upstairs on the headset to Ditka on the sidelines. And Ditka, we presume, is calling the plays. He, is, he did that for a lot of years before he turned it over to Greg Landry, but for the past couple of years, it's been Greg Landry. At the 20-yard line, it's first and 10 with Morgan in motion. And they give it to Lewis again. And Lewis picks up only a yard. And Sean Jones, who had a brilliant November, makes the tackle. It's almost like it's something different every week with the Chicago Bears. Mike Ditka is doing anything he can do to shake this club up. It's been mostly in changes in personnel with Willis starting instead of Harbaugh and Lewis instead of Anderson. And, and people like Mark Carrier have been benched. But now... It's Greg Landry's turn to go to the penalty box almost. And then he goes upstairs, and of course, Mike Ditka has a headset on. And maybe Mike thinks that this is more valuable, that Greg maybe can see something upstairs and pass it on to Mike down below. Uh, when you're losing and when you've lost five in a row, I can hardly blame, though, Ditka and Landry, for that matter, trying to do anything they can do to win. No play. And Sean Jones was clearly across the line, and the only question is, was he induced? Dale Hamer with the call momentarily. Upside. Defense. The play was killed because the defender got so far in the backfield. Five yards. Still second down. <laughs> Even if he's three inches across the line, the play is killed. John Jones coming off a big game against Detroit where he had three sacks that carried him up to eight and a half for the season. Uh, he was looking for one right there. Bears have lost five straight, and as you can see on that graphic, four of those losses, the last four, came against teams that had losing records entering the game. And that's the first time the Bears have lost four games in a row to teams with losing records in the 73-year history of the franchise. Brad Muster takes the toss and takes it out to the 34-yard line for another Chicago first down, so an impressive beginning on the ground for the Bears. And this is kind of typical of the Bears' season. Uh, they did the same thing to Cleveland a week ago. They dominated in the early moments, took the ball all the way down field with plays just like this, running the football, Muster and Neil Anderson, and then when they got down inside the 20, they self-destructed. Willis threw it out on the flat. It was picked off and returned 92 yards for a touchdown by David Brandon, and that set the tone for the rest of the game. A couple more turnovers, and, and Cleveland beat them. Yeah, but really, when you look at the way the Bears move the football, 
uh, this is a team, uh, they're like number six in the entire National Football League offensively. And you can see the confusion with the Bears, and Willis has to take a timeout. And that's, that's from the sidelines. That's personnel. There was a confusion there as far as who should be in the game. That's not P.T. Willis's fault. That's somebody on the sidelines. To you by Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering. By Miller Lite, it's everything you want a beer to be. By the Diamond Tennis Bracelet, this Christmas, give her the gift of love, diamonds. And by Sprint, not just another phone company. Well, because of the uh, play-calling situation, which we have begun to detail, the play didn't come in in time. It cost Chicago a timeout on this, the opening drive of the game. They picked up two first downs. They have a first and ten at their own 33. Three minutes and 38 seconds into the game. And Brad Musher takes it out to the 36-yard line where he is gang-tackled after a pickup of three. The deposed starting quarterback, temporarily deposed, Jim Harbaugh, number four, standing there with Ditka, and they're alternating the tight ends, Jennings and Blackwell, as the messengers. And instead of signaling the play in, they will send in messengers, or at least thus far. And Ditka last night told us that we shouldn't necessarily expect P.T. Willis to go the distance tonight, that he expects to give Harbaugh some playing time as well. So it is a clear-cut case of musical players here in Chicago taking it up any way they can to try to win a ball game. Second down and seven from the 36-yard line. And the pass is incomplete, intended for Darren Lewis. And it will be third down and seven. When you question Ditka about some of the moves, whether it's Willis for Harbaugh, Lewis for Anderson, or whatever, he reduces it to we're just trying to do things differently, trying to get things stirred up to win. Translation, I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> well, an O for November will do that for you. And I <laughs> noticed, Al, on the sidelines, you didn't pry, you didn't push him. <laughs> you didn't have him by the neck or anything like that. No. <laughs> We haven't seen that in a while, have we? No. Third down and seven at the 36-yard line, and Neil Anderson is now in the game out of the shotgun. Anderson goes into the pattern, and the pass is caught by Anderson for a first down. He's covered and tackled by Al Smith up at the 48, and that's another Chicago first down on an impressive opening drive. And a good reaction by Neil Anderson, expecting the ball to be towards the sideline. It was back to the inside of the field, and he had to pivot falling back to the middle and making the catch. That was one of those plays that just goes into the scorebook as a, as a first down reception, but he'll have a pretty lot nifty. More. He'll have a lot more if you're trying to cover him with the middle linebacker, Al Smith. He's one of the fine receivers out of the backfield. In fact, good enough that they can use him out of the flank. You're exactly right, Danny. He has great concentration, and he kept his eye on that ball. Lewis back in the game, and Lewis hits behind the line and tackled by William Fuller for a loss of one, and Fuller started the game. He was in for two plays, but he came to the stadium tonight with the flu, came out, and now back in. He was, uh, got a bad case of the flu. He had a 104-degree temperature yesterday, and there's a real question mark as to what kind of stamina Fuller will have tonight. To a lesser degree, strong safety Bubba McDowell stricken with the flu. But if that's, uh, if that's the play of a guy who's not well, Jim Eddy, the defensive coordinator, might want to see Fuller come from his bed to the ballpark more often. He's going to, Eddie's going to pace Fuller tonight. Mm -hmm. If it's a 10-play drive, he probably will come out somewhere in the middle of it. And he's been in for only three or four plays and already perspiring very heavily. Second down and 11. And no game as Al Smith tackles Brad Muster at the line of scrimmage. <laughs> setting up a third and 11. Al got his first Pro Bowl last year, and he is the spiritual leader of this Houston defensive team and one of the most likable guys in the NFL. And probably got that Pro Bowl recognition a year late, but uh, when you get that first Pro Bowl, it's a, it's a sweet experience. And Al, who's made a couple ankle tackles so far in this game, came up with his second one there. This is the tenth play of the opening drive. The Bears have had the ball for six and a half minutes, but they haven't crossed midfield. It's third down and 11. That's Anderson in the backfield along with Willis. Everybody into the pattern. Willis throws to the far side, and that's batted down, incomplete. Jerry Gray got a hand on it, intended for Anthony Morgan. And so the Bears control the ball for 6 minutes and 44 seconds, don't even reach the 50, and have to punt. Well, Willis got it all tied up in the traffic. He looked out there to Anthony Morgan all the way. He made it easy for Jerry Gray, the ex-Pro Bowl Ram, over in the right corner to 
tighten up on Morgan. Willis didn't look to any of his other receivers, just inexperienced. Chris Gardaki, the left-footed punter, bounces in at the 22, and it takes a good Chicago roll, and the Oilers will be pinned very deep at their five. Royston will take over for the first time. <laughs> There's an ugly duckling that became a swan. <laughs> 50 yards swan with 8.03 yeah. to go in the scoreless opening quarter. Broken left arm and not expected back, and there is Moon on the left. Cody Carlson, good backup quarterback. Let him do a win on Thanksgiving Day against Detroit. And he begins the game tonight. And we'll take a look at the offense in a moment as Houston sets up at its own five-yard line. First time they've had the ball in the game, 8.03 to go in the quarter. And Carlson begins by going to the air. From the end zone, he throws to one of the new Oilers. That's Webster Slaughter making the catch at the 11-yard line. Lorenzo White is the sole running back having a great year. Then they go in the run and shoot with the four wideouts. Jeffrey Slaughter, the uh, free agent from Cleveland, Gibbons, and Curtis Duncan having a fine season. The guys up front, Donnelly starts for Mags in left tackle. Munchak and Matthews have been terrific for years. Dawson at right guard, and David Williams coming into his own now at right tackle, the interior five. Mike Singletary with four games to go in his career. Wrapping it up, and this is 12th and final season. On second and four. Carson, good protection, and then the pass is incomplete. A little high intended for Ernest Gibbons. Take a look at the Chicago defense. They begin tonight with a 4-1-6, four down lineman, and the guys up front are Roper, McMichael, the Fridge, Perry, and Dent, Singletary, the sole linebacker, and then against the run and shoot, the six defensive backs. Wolford, Stinson, Gale, Carrier. They normally start against teams with regular offenses, and then Thane and Tate are the extra backs against the Houston run and shoot. And there is a slim down appliance. William Perry as thin as I have ever seen him. Third down and four at the 11 yard line. Again, Carlson to throw. And he fires to the 25-yard line, and that's incomplete. Ernest Givens covered well by David Tate. Ball and defensive back getting there simultaneously. Fourth down. David Tate, one of the six defensive backs, one of the two added to the coverage. And he makes a great play, timing it out perfectly. And avoiding the flag, that was just a great execution by Tate as he bats the ball away from Ernest Givens. And on these first two drives, the battle of field position is apparently being won by the Chicago Bears. Greg Montgomery, the league's leading punter, and this is not a thing of beauty, fielded at the Chicago 48-yard line by Anthony Morgan, and he is tackled just short of midfield. So but the a, Oilers are free and out. But a good play by Morgan. He took the hit, but by fielding the ball, that may have taken a bad bounce. He might have saved his team 10 or 15 yards. FC playoff scramble. Every time the Raiders are written off as dead, back they come with an impressive win. Beat Kansas City yesterday, 28 to 7. They'll be in Miami next week. Raiders, Dolphins on Monday Night Football. Here, 7 3 to go. First quarter, no score. Bears have it at their own 49 yard line. And Darren Lewis swings to the outside and takes it to the Oiler 43 yard line, tackled by Al Smith after a gain of eight. Jim Eddy, as demonstrative as any assistant coach or any head coach, for that matter, in the National Football League, the Houston defensive coordinator. Well, and he's just witnessed one of the things all defensive coordinators go wild about, and that's a missed tackle. Credit Lewis with a nifty piece of improvisation getting to the outside, but Jerry Gray came up and whiffed on the tackle that maybe would have held it to a, a one or two yard gain instead of a nice little seven or eight yard pickup. Second down and a long two, and Brad Muster picks up a first down, takes the ball to the 38-yard line, and Al Smith gets credit for another tackle. Not a real tall linebacker. Smith is only 6'1", but he gets 250 pounds plus on that frame, and he is active, and in many ways, he reminds me physically and the way he moves sideline to sideline of a younger Mike Singletary. I mean, that's lofty praise. But Al Smith is a player that in many ways reminds me of the way Singletary, when he was younger, used to roll the middle. Meanwhile, the Bears are quietly blowing out the fifth-ranked defense on the ground. 
First down from the 38-yard line, and Lewis again picks up four, takes it to the 34 with five and a half minutes to go. No score first quarter. When you talk about two outside linebackers uh, change over the course of the season. Remember Lamar Lathan, good outside linebacker. He's out with a with a cracked bone in his leg. He's being replaced by Rick Graff. And over the other side, Johnny Meads, a former outstanding player. He has been waived. And uh, rookie Eddie Robinson is in there at the right linebacking position. So Al Smith has been forced to take up a lot of the slack. And there is Lathan, who is watching from the sideline. Second and six, Chicago at the 34-yard line. Muster in motion. The play fake, good fake, but then Willis has to throw it away as Muster is blanketed by Eddie Robinson, the rookie linebacker. And I think that's the first time that we've seen Willis throw it into the flats as David Brandon took one back 92 yards, and he put that up in the seats when he saw the coverage. There will be no more interceptions in the flat for PT. At least right away. Third down and six last week in that game at Cleveland. A very impressive opening drive. And then all of a sudden, as Frank mentioned, through the pass in the flat, David Brandon ran it back 92 yards. And the Browns never trailed. Neil Anderson is in the game in this third down situation, flanking Willis in the shotgun. Houston with a five-man rush. Willis hangs in the pocket and floats one out there for Morgan. And he makes the catch at the five-yard line. The defensive back, Jerry Gray, was behind him. And now are they going to say he was out of bounds? They are going to say he was out of bounds at the five-yard line. And Morgan says, what? No. Oh, P.T. Willis read the blitz all right. And he goes to the fly with Anthony Morgan. They were both right on. But the pressure was such that Willis... Off his back foot. Couldn't get the ball deep where he wanted to get the football. He threw it short. He has to come down with both feet inbounds. And Anthony Morgan, perhaps that he played a little more. He has been injured on and off. Has not played that much. Only four receptions this year. Did not have the presence of mind to get that other foot down. That was an easy catch. He could have done it easily. Mm -hmm. That was an easy catch of really what was a bad pass. I mean, nine times out of ten, fellas, that ball is going to be intercepted. Only well, because the Houston secondary lost track of the football was that not an intercepted pass. Well, they're in that man coverage on the blitz, and he, he, Jerry Gray was concentrating on not getting beat deep. The Bears have taken a delay of game penalty, and uh, will the Oilers accept it? And they will. They'll do them a favor. You know, so much has been said about the Oilers' offense, and of course, Warren Moon not playing tonight, and they are dramatic with their run and shoot, and led by this man, Jack Pardee, but they also have the fifth-ranked defense in the National Football League after 12 weeks, and there is Warren Moon. I talked with him at Link last night, and he feels he will be back for Cleveland, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Well, the, uh, the Oilers accepted the penalty. It gives Gardaki that much more room in which to angle his kick, and he sends it out of bounds at about the 12-yard line, and that's exactly where they will mark it, so Houston will have it again very deep in their own territory. 437 to go in the scoreless opening quarter. Astrodome in Houston, Texas. Oilers have it. 437 to go. First quarter, no score. First and 10 at the 12. It's their second possession. They were springing out on the first, and here's their first running play of the night. Lorenzo White having a terrific season to the 21. He starts the game 80 yards shy of 1,000 yards this year. And it did not take the Oilers long to discover where John Roper has replaced Trace Armstrong over at the left defensive end. And you know they're going to work there. Roper, a linebacker, playing in a down position for the Bears as they try to come up with and be effective with their 4-2 defense. And one thing the Bears have to do with this adjusted defense for the run and shoot is stop the running game. And that means stop Lorenzo White. Second and a yard and a half, and Lorenzo White does not get it. He is stopped at the 21-yard line, can't get on track. Perry gets credit for the tackle, third and very short. Well, Mike Singletary, who's been playing with the Bears for a long time, whether it's Baylor or Chicago, a graduate of the University in Waco and playing in Houston for the final time, and... Uh, Interestingly enough, he's going to end his regular season career in Texas because their final game is at Dallas. He went to what? Worthy High School right here in Houston. 
They are so rightfully proud of the future Hall of Famer. Third and one from the 21-yard line. And Carlson to throw for the first down. And to the 29-yard line, the catch is made by Curtis Duncan, having a great year, his 62nd catch of the season. Well thrown, too, by Cody Carlson. That was not bad coverage. Duncan went down, picked up about eight or nine on it. Carlson right on the money, keeping it down low. Tough to defend that. And a fine catch. You either have to be in the wrong position or real short to defend that pass. Beautifully thrown. First down, Oilers at the 29. Two and a half minutes to go for a quarter, no score. On a delay, this is White with room to roam. Close to a first down. Up to the 39-yard line, tackled by David Tate. You know, we're talking about Roper playing a linebacker, playing in that down position. If we could run that again, you would take a look at Roper, who's unfamiliar with coming upfield, and he did not close back down on it. And a huge gaping hole over on the right side. There he is. John Roper that the Bears are watching. There he is out on the end in the down position. And easily taken wide by David Williams. Huge gaping hole. Roper doesn't get back to it. Big pickup by the Oilers. Enough for a first down. First and 10 at the 40-yard line. That's Ernest Givens in motion. Cody Carlson in his sixth year. Out of Baylor. Throws in great coverage that time. And it was too great, in fact, because two flags come in. Bain all over Givens and it'll cost them. When you're a defensive back and you make a play that you know in your mind is close, Pass don't jump up defense and immediately start looking to the sidelines for the official. The be cool, man. Yep. <laughs> Richard needs to... You're right, Frank. Be yeah. cool. I mean, you. he makes the hit, and granted, it was, it was flagged, but you cannot... Let's see, is it there early? Yep, he's right. clear over the back, but he comes up right away, spinning Four around, looking to see if there are flags. Your play has drawn attention to what you've done. Don't compound it by with a coming up with a guilty look on your face. That'll that'll get that referee who's on the bubble for sure. The old cookie jar look. <laughs> First and ten from the other 45-yard line. Draw again, but this time the Bears have it well defense, and White can go nowhere. Sean Gale helping to push him out of bounds, and there is a marker down. That's a, 45. Is it a marker or yes. is it a body part something came out of there a yellow body part I don't know. <laughs> face mask five yards into the run first maybe the face mask also came out oh. face mask infraction here Pardee watching his team move the ball up the field well what a good look at Lorenzo White lowering his lowering his shoulder and, and getting in there there was the flag flying through, and Sean Gale, I guess he said he had his hand around the mask longer and a little more firmly than he should have. Well, that was the five-yard variety. You could all see whatever it was was not blatant. Sean Gale playing almost like a linebacker for the Bears tonight. First and five now from the 50-yard line, and the catch is made by Curtis Duncan, and he gets body slammed down by Donnell Wolford. Whoa, if there's any question about Cody Carlson's arm, he erased it right there. He had that smoking out there on a line. Good tackle, but I mean, that ball clear across the field from the other hash mark, across the field with a lot of zip on it, and enough to get the first down. That's nothing more than Duncan taking advantage of a colossal cushion on the part of Donnell Wolford. Calculated cushion on the part of Wolford, too. He's opposite side of the field and giving him a little room. And a good pass by Carlson. Well, he's lips of Kevin Gilbride, the offensive coordinator, conversing with Moon on the sideline as Carlson retreats from first and ten. And Carlson's pass is incomplete, intended for Webster Slaughter. Slaughter is one of the four free agents declared by Judge Doty in Minnesota in October. Remember, Keith Jackson signed with Miami. Garen Vera signed with San Francisco. Slaughter was eligible to sign, and he came here, and the other was D.J. Dozier, who has not signed. And of those free agents, Webster Slaughter could have had the toughest adjustment coming into this run-and-shoot offense because what he had to do was unlearn everything he knew about the passing game coming in 
to Houston because the run and shoot is unlike anything you have ever done before. Wherever Slaughter's been before, the play is called in the huddle. That's the route you run. Here, it's all side adjustment. Second down and 10. And they drop it off, and a nice move by White to escape the initial tackle, what would have been the initial hit. He gets to the 41-yard line. Steve McMichael makes the tackle. And uh, it will be third down and eight when the second quarter begins, because that'll do it for the first 15 minutes of play. First quarter ends. Nothing, nothing. It's return with Monday Night Football after this message in a word for ABC Station. Start the second quarter. Vital game tonight for the Houston Oilers. And you get the feeling whoever gets hot down the stretch in the AFC is going to be the team. It's a, a wide open scramble. We know one is hot right now, San Diego. What a remarkable turnaround they have put together to be 8 5, lost their first four games. Uh, the Oilers, are, they look at this game tonight, it is a must win for them. And we, w and we also know one that is not, and that's the Buffalo Bills. Back to back losses to the Colts and the Jets. And now, what? Now it looks like the road to the Super Bowl in the AFC may have to go through Pittsburgh. Yep. They have the best record in the conference at the moment. Third down and eight. That's and a fun ball. Gets hit. The ball is loose. Richard Dent was there to dislodge it. But the Oilers recover it. It's David Williams, the tackle, who maintains possession. Well, there's something we don't see very often. Richard Dent hitting the quarterback. <laughs> Only several hundred times in his career has he gotten around that corner and come in from the backside and put the hurt on a quarterback. And that was well before Carlson is in the throwing motion. And that is a fumble all the way. And Richard Dent, one of the superior pass rushers who has ever played in the National Football League. He beats Kevin Donnelly, who's in there for Don Meggs. Montgomery to punt on fourth and 16. Anthony Morgan back to receive the ball bounces at the one and goes sideways but it also had enough forward momentum to take it into the end zone for the touchback so the bears will get it with 1407 to play in the half and no score in Houston. to us uh, there he is in the blue shirt the leading receiver for the bears not in uniform tonight on the inactive list because of a badly bruised hip sustained last week in the cleveland game they expect him back next week and also inactive tonight is Trace Armstrong the defensive end with a knee injury so there are the two bear inactives of the 47 you see how needy he was he put his gum back in the wrapper I mean there's a man of the 90s yep. artificial surface oh, yeah sure on grass he just oh, it out. he got the gum down in his turf and it's a mess from the 20 yard line P.T. Willis going very deep and overthrows it and Gray intercepts but there's a flag down Jerry Gray for the moment has his fourth interception of the season and runs it back to the 45 yard line well my guess would be that the flag is on Anthony Morgan for interference offensive interference I think Houston may get to keep this ball well Gray did step in front of it there's a collision we'll in any event looked like Morgan was the one shoving off We'll see. There was definitely a collision. That's interference. Defense. Mm -hmm. Well, this goes against First Houston. There was contact, and you could see Jerry Gray ends up cutting off Morgan, but Morgan delivers a pretty good blow. Let's watch it this way. This could have gone either way. There's now, Gray going. Put well, that he gets the left like arm that. out. That's that what brings the flag. Absolutely interference. Yeah, he put the he... left arm up and drew the flag right there. Yeah, it was the left arm. You're exactly right. That's what brought it in. So what looked like a turnaround here, and the Oilers' ball ends up being a nice gainer for the Chicago Bears. Jerry Gray, the longtime Ram, plan B pickup. That amounts to a 38-yard penalty on the bomb thrown by Willis on the first down. He gives it to Muster. And he takes it inside the 40 for a gain of four. And ABC's Monday Night Football is being brought to you by all the team members at Saturn. A different kind of company, a different kind of car. Bears are really hurt in their short game with Waddle on the bench. And all season long, they've suffered 
to some degree with the loss of Thornton at the tight end. Pretty good receiver from the tight end. Their tight ends Jennings and Blackwell are not what you would characterize as good short yardage receivers. So they're really hurting the bottle on the bench tonight. I'll say this about Jennings. He catches the ball when it comes to him. Second and six. And Neil Anderson takes the ball to the 34-yard line. And things are starting to pick up a little bit down on the field. I don't know if it was the penalty or something started before that, but the, the, the level of this game between the Oiler defense and the Bear offense has just taken a notch up. It's It's gone up a level. And again, as we mentioned, this Jim Eddy's defense in single digits in all categories. Fifth overall, ninth against the rush, sixth against the pass, and the Bears have been pushing them around pretty good. Well, the Bears' offense this year, strangely enough, uh, at least statistically playing a whole lot better than their defense. Third down and a short three at the 35-yard line, and Willis runs into Anderson, runs right into him, and that's the end of that play. Well, from where Neil Anderson was in the backfield and where Willis pivoted, it's impossible to make the connection. Anderson was either on the wrong side or PT pivoted the wrong way. It's, it's tough to cast blame here. Well, Willis obviously expected him on the other side because he had to bring the ball back. And, uh, and Keith, Horn, Keith Van Horn's going, how did it end up being my ball? And I think and Gordocki's going to throw the ball for Lewis, and it's knocked away at the last moment, and it's a flag down at the 48, and there's also another flag at the 33, and Gray is getting into it. Two flags for, I believe, two separate calls here. Well, one thing we're sure of, Gardaki doesn't throw the ball very often because that was a lousy pass. Well, he threw it wide open. He threw one against uh, Green Bay in the game at Chicago I'm that not, was the key play of the game. I'm not talking frequency. I'm talking yeah. ar artistically. That was a well set up. Whether or not it would been, have been called back, we're going to find out. But it certainly was one that could have been completed. The officials, uh, with a lengthy discussion, as we say, there's a flag at the 48, and then another one was dropped at the 33, which would indicate you've got two separate penalties to be announced here. Ineligible receiver downfield. Oh, yeah, it's right in the middle. Well, needless to say, these will both be declined. We have two fouls on the offensive team. Unsportsmanlike conduct, illegal substitution, number 33. An ineligible downfield, number 55. Both are declined. First down, useless. Well, Roper obviously coming off the line on the coverage, getting downfield and being flagged for that. And that's the luxury of a team that's won only four ball games. You can take chances. You can go for things on fourth down that maybe if you're the team in a playoff hunt, you play it a little more conservatively. The Bears uh, certainly not in that position tonight. With the uh, with Lewis flagged on that play, I think what they were trying to do was emulate that play against Green Bay at Green Bay, where they had the receiver standing very close to the sideline as if he wasn't a part of the play, and attempted to, as Jim Eddy, oh, Dick is all over somebody here. Meanwhile, Dick is Dick is talking to the officials here, perhaps in regard to the call. At least the call on Lewis. They got away with, as it turned out, in the play at Green Bay, it was an illegal play, and it was admitted as such by the league the following week. Now, here's what we're talking about. Watch the bottom the bottom of the screen. There he is, Lewis. But, Al, your point is well made. If you're coming into the ball game, you must go beyond the numbers before you, you report. And if you are leaving the game, you just can't stop a yard from the sideline and run a play. And that's what they did in Green Bay. Here's Lorenzo White on first down from the 36-yard line. And White, for a gain of 15, takes it across the 50 where he's tackled by David Tate and a first down. What I don't understand about Mike's outburst there, if that's what he's arguing about, is that 
with it being an incomplete pass, and there was certainly no penalty on the end of the play. It's not that it was poorly played by Jerry Gray outside. Yep. It's a moot point. It was an yep. incomplete pass anyway. Yep. It's not like you got the first down and then had it taken away from you. First down for the Oilers just across midfield. 11 minutes to go in the first half. With no score. Crossing. And then bobbled and caught by Jeffrey. And then he's tackled by a trio of Bears led by Lemuel Stinson. And for Haywood Jeffries, he's on a pace to catch close to 100 passes again this season. 74 coming into the game three quarters of the way through the year last year. Oh, but he, would, he will get the ball every time tonight when he looks out there and finds single coverage. Stinson lined up over on the short side of the field in single coverage and the other five defensive backs spread across the field. And Cody Carlson, just like Warren Moon, read it quickly, didn't hesitate, fired it out there. Second and five at the 45-yard line with Slaughter in motion. And White running into Carlson, and he goes down at the line of scrimmage. So Willis and Anderson come together, and then Carlson and White duplicate the feed. Well, they got 10 days off to work on this stuff, too. Now, there was a wallflower of an offensive play. A pulling lineman ran into Carlson. Carlson ran into White, and White fell down. A chain reaction. There's the pull. Munchak hits Carlson. Carlson hits White, and then White gets in the open and falls down. <laughs> <laughs> now, that, that, that's so ugly, it is laughable. <laughs> and the judges have given it a three. <laughs> I wonder what the coaches say upstairs. <laughs> Boy, that was a beaut. Third down and six at the 45-yard line. Carlson fires, Slaughter got open. First down at the 30-yard line, tackled by Carrier. Uh, Dan talked earlier about how Car Slaughter has adapted to this offense so quickly. It is complex, totally different than what he knew with Cleveland. The numerical signals are different, but watch this. He takes it. Carlson reads the single coverage. Sean Gale, number 23. Not a good man for man cover to begin with. And... Carlson pulled away from the center, saw what it would be. Slaughter made the move to the outside, and that was absolutely perfect run and shoot. First down inside the 30. Good protection again. Going deep and incomplete intended for Haywood Jeffries. Jeffries and... The Mule Stinson in a matchup, not much of a matchup. Jeffries at 6-2 and Stinson at 5-9. They get in a jumping match. You know who's going to win that one. And Jeffries can go up with the best of them. That's because he is one of the best of them. And another thing about these Euler receivers, when you look at their averages per reception, you also come to realize that they are tough because you don't have any of these guys that are averaging 20 yards a catch. These are blue-collar receivers. 10 yards, 11-7, 11-9, 12-3. They're not street guys down the sideline. They're used to making a catch and taking several hits. Second and 10. Carlson wings it to Curtis Duncan. That's his third catch of the night. He's tackled at the 20-yard line, very close to a first down. And how about that for an effort to try to get the first down? Looked like Duncan was going to be forced out of bounds, and he just arched his back. Richard Bain with a hit and arched his back and got really close to the sticks. And he almost got it. Bain laying Don, Donnell Wolford was actually in the coverage. Look at that. And again laying way off, but he came back to make the hit, and that's a superb <laughs> effort by Duncan. It sure is. Now, don't you wish you had a tight end here, Dan? Well, if you were running it, if, if I was running an offense, I'd, I would like to have a tight end. You're right. Third and a short one, and Carlson gets it by thrusting to the 18-yard line to convert a first down for the Oilers with 7.40 to go in the first half and still no score. But the Oilers and Kevin Gilbride there, the offensive coordinator, you can say one thing about this offensive team. They have many weapons, and they're not all just wide receivers. It's an excellent offensive line. 
in the middle with Matthews and Munchak, Dawson, Williams, Donnelly, Mags. These guys are sensational. And the man in back, 44, Lorenzo White, is as good as any running back in the National Football League. First and 10 at the 18-yard line. The three receivers to the left, and again, the lineman runs into Carlson as White picks up about two, and he's tackled by Steve McMichael, who in his 13th season, like Dick has said last night, is playing the best football on the team right now. Oddly enough, he's one of the few players that was not drafted by the Chicago Bears. And again, it's the same pulling guard, Munchak, who collides with Carlson. It could be Carlson just not getting out of there quickly enough. Frank, you are absolutely right. A pulling guard has to pull and go. It is the quarterback's responsibility to get out of the way. And they usually uh, get banged around enough until they learn it. Uh, one run over will do it. Yeah, in motion on second and eight from the 16-yard line. Carlson, and that's not down. Slaughter oh, looks yeah. to the flag, and he gets it. Well, these Six. guys act guilty. They act guilty. This did the same thing we saw earlier on the part of fame. Haywood Jeffries, the intended receiver, 84, and Stinson was right there. He was early, too. Again, we talked about the match of Stinson. Defense, the 32, first down, first block. First of all, it was a good read by Carlson. The blitz was coming, man-to-man -man coverage. They were brought a couple of defensive backs. You see the coverage. And just turning in is the six foot two Jeffries. And here comes five nine Stinson. No way he can do anything to defend that pass except what he did. And he has got to be perfect in his timing, or it's going to be complete, or it's going to draw a flag. First and goal at the six. With Jeffries and knocked away at the last moment in a Stinson Tate sandwich of Jeffrey. That's good defense. They didn't leave Stinson out there all alone. They've looked at the frequency of the Oilers. They do this all the time down here where they go to Jeffries when they're down in close. He has great leaping ability. That time they helped Stinson and they got the coverage they needed. Stinson's having to come over the back and Frank, I'm not sure. Again, that's the defense you want. You got to credit Tate. That might have been a touchdown reception. And Stinson oh. celebrating on first down. Well, certainly Tate they made the move. Jeffries has eight touchdown receptions this season. Ernest Gibbons has nine. Another man to watch. Another man to watch, too, is White as he takes the ball to the two-yard line. And it's going to be third down and goal. Lorenzo White, who scored the game-winning touchdown to culminate the last-minute drive against Detroit on Thanksgiving Day. They ran a draw with him inside the 10, and that fooled the Lion defense, and the Oilers came home with a win. Got a third down, and you got two yards to go. You know they're going to put it up in the air. 11th play of this drive, 5.40 to go. First half, no score, third and goal. Water in motion. Carlson throwing, knocked down at the goal line, intended for Gibbons, and David Tate breaks it up. A big series on the goal line by David Tate, huh? Two. First down, he makes the big hit, knocks the ball loose, and then he comes up on third down and makes the play. And we have seen some good secondary work by David Tate here in the second quarter. And we talked about the size of some of that. Chicago secondary takes one of the big ones. He's 200 pounder and he can really put the hit on you. Time this out beautifully. Reading the eyes of Cody Carlson, maybe a little early, but not enough to draw a yellow flag. So this is a field goal that's exactly the length of an extra point. From the 10 else? yard line, Sonny York Del Greco field goal attempt is good. And that's the first scoring of the evening. So like the 525 to go in the first half. Houston on top, free up. Told me he'll be back for Cleveland. He also told me to say happy birthday to his father, Clinton. And when Doug Smith tells you to do something, <laughs> you roll over and do it. One of the largest human beings I have ever encountered on my... <laughs> Little Doug is with me tonight, Dan. Little Doug is six years old and weighs 90 pounds. Well, mm. big Doug there is 6'6 six, six and about 340 pounds. Del Greco to kick off with the Oilers ahead, 3 nothing, And it's taken at the goal line by Darren Lewis. 
He brings it back to 19, and a flag comes in. Joe Bowden made the tackle. Dale Hamer tells us. Illegal block. Number 31 on the return. After this is to the goal. First the that's Mark Green. That's going to put him back at about the 10-yard line with 5.15 to go in the half. 3-0 Houston. And now it's time for our regular feature on what's new in the world of sports science and technology. And the wonder kisser. <laughs> My number's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's not unlisted either. <laughs> Bears have it at their own 8-yard line after the penalty on the run back. First and ten, Willis, and he has the open receiver Morgan, and he's run out of bounds up at the 30-yard line by Chris Dishman. The Bears this season have been extremely effective when they're backed up deep in their own territory. As you can see, their completion percentage is 82% when they start inside their own 20. The league average is 61. And then from their own 20 to the 50-yard line, they're about even with the league, completing roughly 6 out of 10. A little less than the league average from the 50 to the opposition's 20, and then inside what they refer to as the red zone, the opponent's 20, about 5 percentage points below the league average. So diminishing returns as they work their way downfield. From the 30-yard line, Brad Muster gets only one up to the 31-yard line. If you throw the ball on first down at your own eight-yard line, you're going to have a high percentage of completions. And they're they're pretty good at throwing the ball on first down. Jim Harbaugh, what's his future? Good point. What's anybody's future in the NFL these days? With uh, Judge David Doty in Minneapolis to rule on free agency for hundreds of players with no collective bargaining agreement. And the two Chicago quarterbacks of note, P.T. Willis and Jim Harbaugh both have contracts that expire at the end of the season and will be in that class that will be affected by Judge Doty's ruling. So the quarterback future of the pair is certainly uncertain. Second down and nine. Willis throws. Davis makes the catch, and Wendell Davis takes it out to the 38-yard line. He's tackled by Chris Dishman, and it will be third down and roughly two. Will Fuhrer perhaps a quarterback of the future for Chicago, a rookie and a very confident rookie out of Virginia Tech. We had a chance to watch him in a preseason game against New Orleans. Uh, right now, number three on the depth chart. Played a little last week, four plays, sacked twice and had two incompletions. Through Dickens' reign, 12 different starting quarterbacks, only the San Diego Chargers over that period of time, 11 seasons, have had more. The Chargers have had 14. It's third down and a short three, and there's no play. And there are many flags. Snap, I think, coming a little late as all the Bears' offensive oh, sorry, line. Right of the snap, number 70, five yards. Well, they only called Troy, but they were all moving, and it could have been that the snap was late. In a domed building, mm -hmm. such as the Astrodome, the offensive tackles affected more than anyone else as far as their inability to hear the quarterback. To your right is, is Ozine and the other tackle too, Dan, he's, yep. just like you said. Van Horn on the far side, they are off because they cannot hear the quarterback and they are anticipating what is happening. And a lot of times they get used to a quarterback's rhythm. And it looked that time like Van Horn and Ozine were expecting Willis to call for it, and he did. We've seen some teams go to holding hands. The Bears aren't utilizing that technique. Third and eight, and the catch is made by Morgan, but he loses the football, and now they're saying no catch to begin with. Incomplete. Jerry Gray popped him. And the Bears are forced to punt with 2.40 to go in the first half. Number 17, into Morgan made a dive for the ball and never did control it. You can say, well, wait a minute, isn't that a case of where the ground causes a fumble? That's not the case on a pass reception. Gardaki's punt bounces out of bounds at the 23-yard line, and that's where the Oilers will take it with 2 minutes and 32 seconds to go in the first half. Houston 3, Chicago nothing. Al Michaels, Frank Gifford, 
Dan Deardorf, Monday Night Football. Bears have lost five straight. Houston coming in off the road. They won two of three over an 11-day period, but a critical game for them tonight as they come in with a mark of seven and five. They lead 3-0 to the Oilers. They have it at the 23-yard line, first and 10, as Cody Carlson throws to the 34, and that's complete for a first down into the arms of Ernest Gibbons. And there's the clock, and all three timeouts remaining for the Oilers. There is the clock in one of the quickest first halves I can recall all season long. This game is barely over an hour old, and you see the time remaining in the first half. From the 35... Carlson has to scramble, throws against the grain, and Haywood Jeffrey somehow comes up with it. The mule Stinson with the coverage, and that takes us down to the two-minute warning. That's not the easiest thing to do. You saw Cody Carlson doing the right-handed passer, running to his left, whipping it back. Watch this. Not easy. And Jeffries helps out. He keeps it alive for him right here, breaking away from the defender. Good play by both players. Houston, Texas, all decked out for the holidays. Beautiful sight. Lunch there of City Hall. And we come back inside the Astrodome. The two minutes to go in the first half. Oilers on top, 3 nothing. First and 10 at their own 45-yard line, and they have all three timeouts remaining. Cody Carlson. Out to the 50-yard line, Curtis Duncan makes the catch. The Bears... That ball, think the ball out. came out, and it should be a fumble, but there's been no indication as yet from the officials. And what are they going to rule here? They're going to rule that Houston still has the football. Danell Wolford dislodged it. I think the ball took a very fortunate bounce right back to Duncan, who's we rule. hobbled after the play. play. Forward front. Oh, and Ditka is going wild again. There you see the fumble. And the ball comes right underneath Duncan, and he's able to scoop it back. And Mike on the sidelines again was expressing his unhappiness, and I'm not so sure he didn't have a pretty good case. Mm -hmm. So it's a <laughs> five-yard pickup. I mean, when the ball is fumbled, and right in front of you, you get the ball where it's recovered after it's fumbled. In other words, they're saying at forward progress, the play ended before the fumble. Second and five at the 50. That was Duncan's fourth tack. Here's White. And he is tackled by Sean Gale at the 48-yard line. So for the Oilers now, a critical third and short three. When we talked about the play at some of the defensive backs of the Bears, like Sean Gale, David Tate, Marcus Paul, they played this game like linebackers. And you saw an example of it there. The Oilers have been super successful with that screen play, and this time the Bears cut it off. Third and three, and it's through the hands of Gibbons and incomplete and nearly picked off. Gale was there, and the clock stops with 109, and the Oilers are going to be forced to punt. And the man that Carlson should have looked at was Lorenzo White. He checked to the right side and released, and he was standing all alone on the other side of the first down marker. That would have been nothing more than pitch and catch to White. Well, kudos to the Bears' defense. This is where they have been hurt all year long. They're ranked overall 18th. They've given up a lot of points, and they are playing a very tough offensive team. Very strong tonight. Greg Montgomery to kick. Anthony Morgan standing at his own 10-yard line. Montgomery, the league's leading punter, tries to angle it into the corner, but it goes into the end zone. Almost mm. a tremendous play there by Mike Dumas. Boy, that, there was some athleticism getting up into the air and, and, and springing the ball back, and he almost got it out. Check this out. It's like Carl Lewis. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> That's but Michael Jordan. That's pretty yeah, hanging on good play. <laughs> hang time. Yeah, hanging, <laughs> hanging with Mr. Dumas. <laughs> well, it was a great high jumper, Charlie Dumas, years ago. I believe he was the first man to jump over seven feet. I think it's Steve Hurt to check yeah, that. It was the old first oh. one with the Fosberg flop, wasn't he? Fosberg, Fosberg flop. Oh, that was several years later. That, well, that, that was after Fosberg did it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Fosberg, that was flopped. early on. Fosberg flopped first, and then Fosbury did it later. First down in Chicago from the 20-yard line. They have two timeouts. They set up a screen, and it's Whoa. juggled by Anderson. And he is bounced out of bounds at about the line of scrimmage by Jeff Alm with 51 ticks left. I think Robertson, Marcus Robertson, can't believe that he did not go down. But I hit him with everything I had. And Neil just bounces Lost off. The Look at this shot. Neil concentrates on the ball, knows he's going to get the hit, which he does from Robertson. Tucks it away and gets some yardage out of it. 51 seconds and two timeouts remaining for the Bears, who trail 3-0 from the shotgun. Second and 11. Four-man rush. Willis under pressure has it picked off by Bubba McDowell. Touchdown. And he ought to let Sean Jones spike the ball. Uh, last week against Cleveland, he threw it in the flat. It was picked off by David Brand and taken 92 yards. This time he puts it in the other flat. Touchdown, Houston. It's John Jones on the pass rush that if he doesn't hit Willis before he throws it, certainly distracts him and not allows him to follow through. And another Chicago mistake. Look at Jones right on Willis as he throws the ball. It is amazing. This is the sixth interception that has been run back for a touchdown this season against the Chicago Bears. Six. When you throw it out of the flat, it's going to be taken back to six. Del Greco for the point after. That ball, I think you're right, Dan. A lot went off. And Willis has a very strong arm. He's not a big man, but he has a strong arm. He throws a tight spiral. That one was yep. kind of wounded when it went out there, and it just didn't have anything on it. And Mike Ditka unhappy with his left tackle, Troy Ozine. Ditka seen it, well, he saw this act last week with Brandon. Six touchdowns. That's one short of the NFL record, a dubious mark held by the 1967 Patriots and the 84 Chiefs. Timed out perfectly. Really nice work. McDowell concentrating on the sidelines. And another reminder, Bubba McDowell, one of the two Houston Oiler defensive players that's been stricken with the flu, William Fuller, the other. The other. And this is your reward, Bubba, for playing sick. You know, he forced a fumble last week, hitting Detroit quarterback Eric Kramer, and William Fuller took it in for a touchdown. He just made Ditka and Willis sick. Halftime, Mike Singletary in his final year, part of a conversation we had with him last night. Bruce Coslett, the Jets coach, and Brian Washington, yesterday's hero in the game at Buffalo, joining us from New York, coming up at the half. Del Greco bouncing it to the 28-yard line, and it's covered up by the linebacker, Ron Rovira, with 40 seconds remaining in the first half. Bonno and Robinson and Tim Ryan exchanging pleasantries. And other assorted greetings. Ditka. You know, we mentioned at the top all the speculation, rampant speculation. In terms of his contract, he has one more year remaining on next year. At one point during the year, he said, I don't know if I'll be back. And then he immediately followed up with that by saying, I'll be back. Nobody really seems to know exactly what's going to happen, but as we said at the beginning tonight, he indicated in no uncertain terms he intends to return next year. Anderson. Well, I, I just have one thing to say concerning Mike Ditka, and that is simply this. He is one of the finest competitors that has ever played any sport or ever coached in any sport. And if he, for some reason, decides that he's going to leave coaching and leave the National Football League, that is our loss. That is everyone's loss who enjoys the game of football because he is really not different now than he ever was. It's just that his demeanor and his demonstrative behavior is accentuated when you're losing. And I, for one, am casting my vote. I hope this gets back. Second down and eight. 
This is Anderson on an inside give, and he takes it out to the 33-yard line. I think a lot of people not only expect him to be back as a little scuffle breaks out. Kozlowski's second bout of the evening. But right. He'll be around for a while, too. Uh, Mike has been through this before in 89 after a 12-4 and four season. In, 80, in 1988, they went 6-10. and 10. They lost six in a row, uh, eight out of the last ten, and then, then they turned it around the next year, and they were 11-5 back in the playoffs. So he's been through it. He knows what he has to do. During that season in 89, you'll recall, that was the year after he had the heart attack as the half ends. He said, at one point, we stink. At another point, we're not going to win another game. And as it turned out, he was right. Well, right now, they're on the verge of going down for the sixth time in a row at the half to score is 10-0 Oilers. And we'll return with halftime activities after this message from the NFL in a word from our ABC station. Forget with the headset again, Greg Landry, the offensive coordinator, upstairs for the first time in about three years. Ditka on the headphones with Landry as the second half begins with a touchback. Gardaki sends it about seven yards deep. And the Oilers, who lead 10-0, will take over at the 20 as ABC's Monday Night Football is being brought to you by Bud Light. If you want great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down, make it a Bud Light by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by new aspirin-free Bayer Select. Put the help where it hurts. Where it hurt for Chicago was at the end of the first half when Bubba McDowell picked off a pass to turn what would have been a 3 nothing deficit into a 10 nothing deficit. And now what Chicago does not want to do, and we have said it many times, unfortunately, not give up any more points because they are not a team that can play catch-up football. The one thing you have to say in Chicago's behalf, though, is that they have played real hard. I mean, they have worked. They've been aggressive. They're physically doing the things that it takes to win, but they're just not making plays. And there's a difference between making plays and playing hard. End the round. Give it. Gibbons begins the second half with a 45-yard end around. Bruce Matthews throwing a tremendous block to Springham. Gale makes the tackle. Well, we talked about Roper playing in an unusual position. He wasn't in a down lineman position, but he's playing that left end. He went for the fake, came in pursuit, got caught on the inside, and away went Gibbons. Boy, and Al, you touched on Bruce Matthews' block. David Tate, number 40. And watch Matthew 74. He will come in. We'll have to see it on a wider shot. He puts David Tate into the next zip code. What a well-designed and executed play by the Oilers. Officially 44 yards after the Oilers have gained 43 composite yards in the first half. Carlson, and that simply dropped at the 28-yard line. That was the first pass intended for Leonard Harris, who has played very sparingly tonight. Let's go back once again. Watch the right side of your screen for number 74, and that's David Tate. There is Bruce Matthews, the all-pro center, and that is why. <laughs> that is not just putting your man in a position where he will not make the play, that is making a statement at the same time. You know, he has gone to the Pro Bowl in three different positions yeah. at the offensive line. He is he just, he's a master. Of course, the brother of Clay Matthews, the all-pro linebacker of the Cleveland Browns. He was so destructive to Chicago last week. May the force be with you, and it is. Here's Lorenzo White, spins off the back of William Perry, and lights his way to the 32-yard line for a gain of four. Lorenzo White, and there, Bruce Matthews in his 10th season, Clay Matthews, his brother in Cleveland in his 14th season. Mm -hmm. A couple of noble Trojans. They're not only good, they're durable, longevity, all the all the hallmarks that you expect to see from a from an all-pro player. And uh, mom and dad Matthews ought to be mighty proud of their two NFL sons. About Bruce, if they can move him anywhere, he never complains. He probably is more effective if that's possible at the tackle position. They need a center, that's where he is. That's why he makes seven figures, too. Third and six at the 33 yard line. And Carson drops the ball and recovers it at the 39 yard line. That was Richard Dent coming in again as he did in the first half to knock it loose. And Dale Hamer was almost knocked every which way but loose. <laughs> Zorich and Tim Ryan doing a little shoulder pad shuffling. 
There he is, 95, working against this time Don Maggs. And it was a little hand fighting, and that's called by the skin of your finger, finger, finger. Richard Dent just got a glove on Carlson, but it was enough to dislodge the ball. Montgomery to punt. How did they not block that? Yeah. It bounces at the nine. And that pins Chicago at the eight-yard line. Mark Harrier came very close to blocking that kick. When somebody comes free on the inside, more often than not, he gets the ball. Right there on the left, look how close Mark Carrier came to getting that puck. Carrier that time came in, tried to block the punt, expecting Montgomery to kick right down the middle of the field. Montgomery, watch the right side of your screen. Carrier's going to come to a point expecting Montgomery to kick down the middle, and only pure luck in Montgomery angling it towards the sideline made him miss Carrier. He didn't even know Carrier was there. And the right sideline. Here's Darren yeah. Lewis on Chicago's first possession of the third quarter, picking up four. William Fuller makes the tackle. 12.40 to go, third quarter, 10-0 Houston. In many ways, that's indicative of what's been happening to the Bears all year. You try, you try, you just one foot, one way off center that, that just is what's causing you again not to make that play, and that is the look of a man who's warming up. Jim Harbaugh looks like he may get a shot at quarterbacking the Bears here in the second half. Second and five at the 13-yard line. Muster, big hole. Brad Muster. Barrels his way out to the 33-yard line. Well, the cry has always been, we have to get the ball to muster more often. A very effective of an inside runner, good receiver. Good surge over on the right side, too, for Brad Muster. Well, was a, a good-looking hole. Let's take a look at it here. Van Horn is on the right side. Tom Thayer boards. And that is manhandling the Euler defensive line. If I know in its center, that, that was a well-executed play. From the 33-yard line, here's Lewis. And he exploits that hole for a six-yard gain out to the 39-yard line. And this is, I think, very important for the Bears. It's 10-0. This is not a lead that you cannot make up. And the Bears should and are staying on the ground. I think with Peter Tom Willis at quarterback, in only his third year, this is not the time you rely on him to pass you to a victory. If the Bears are going to crawl back into this game, it's uh, the fact that they're going to have to demonstrate their ability to run the football. And at least so far on this drive, they've done so. They started at their 12. They've reached the 39. It is second down and four. And here's Muster through the middle. And Brad Muster bangs his way out to the 49-yard line for another first down. The rookie, Eddie Robinson, out of Alabama State, makes the tackle. And the Bears going up the middle, much to Jim Eddy's disbelief. Remember, Doug Smith is on injured reserve, their Pro Bowl nose guard. Jeff Alm has taken his place. Al Smith is blocked. Childress is blocked. This is by far and away the best-looking running game the Bears have had so far. Here's Jeff Alm. He had a serious knee injury a year ago, and he has been the man they have called on to replace... The very talented Doug Smith. And a very large Doug Smith. From the 49-yard line, Muster's nice carry is a fumble. And Chicago is on its way to self-destructing again. Ray Childress with the recovery. And did you see Ray Childress not only recover the ball, but knock P.T. Willis out of the way and keep him from getting it? I mean, that's, again, I'm back to making play. Ray Childress made the play after Muster's fumble. He's having such a great oh. year. That's his second fumble of the season. He forced three of them. He has nine sacks. He's done it all for Houston now. Watch this. Muster carrying it a little loosely. Sean Jones got the hand in there to knock a three. And here comes Childress. Childress altered his course on his way to the ball to beat P.T. Willis to it and to cut Willis off before he could get there. I mean, that's just an instinctive play by a football player. Some guys do it and some guys don't. There was a good look at him taking the legs out from under Willis before he got to the football. Gibbons in motion. Oilers at the 43-yard line of Chicago. 9.57 to go in the third. Here's White. 
on a misdirection play, taking it inside the 35, and that's another first down. And that's also some very fine running and some good-looking blocking, too. Is quite getting close to the 1,000-yard mark. He is now 24 yards shy of four figures. Watch this cutback. This is what he's best at. He hasn't got great speed ahead, but he is so quick for the big man. He weighs about 222, 225. So quick out of the cut. Well, Lorenzo White is going to end up the year with over 1,000 yards and over 50 receptions as well. And that is, that is a versatile combination. Roger Craig in his prime territory. Yep. From the 32, here's White again. Picking up eight more. You know, it's really killed Chicago this season. We talked about the, the big plays that have hurt. Coming into this game, they had turned the ball over 23 times. And what's really killed them is that after those turnovers, on 15 occasions, the opposition has gone in to score a touchdown. So they cough it up, and then the defense can't hold. And the next thing you know, there's another L in the column. Ray Childress on the bench, a player that people down here in Texas are partial to comparing him to the great Bob Lilly. There it is, uh, the, percent, the percentage on drives following a turnover, league average less than one in three, and against the Bears, 65%. Well, they're trying to cash in here after a turnover. And this is Slaughter for a first down. Forward progress to the 13-yard line. Well, Emil Stenson came out of the coverage as Carlson looked over to the right side. Stenson trying to make something happen in the middle. Left the receiver. He had all day in the pocket, inside. Too. Watch, Watch the time. Watch the time in the pocket while you're watching it as well. Stenson goes in, tries to help out with the big man, Jeffries. Leads his own receiver. And Duncan gets inside the 15. A problem for the Bears tonight. And there's Vince Tobin, their defensive coordinator. If they're not getting a pass rush from Richard Dent, they're not getting a pass rush at all. Dent has been the only Bear player anywhere near the quarterback tonight. Carlson with beautiful protection. Almost every time he's gone back. And here's White taking it to the six-yard line. My good friend Bob Young, the offensive line coach of the Oilers, is smiling right now. <laughs> My large friend Bob. He, he was one of the fine guards in the National Football League back in the 70s. Are you kidding me? Oh, he was a tremendous football player. He's a, in a great offensive line. You guys had one of the yeah. best ever put he together. He played guard opposite Conrad Dobler, and he is the line coach of this group. You ought to get and him they a, are taking charge of the game. You ought to get him a commercial. Uh, I, I, at the very least, I ought to send him a case. <laughs> Six-yard line. Lake goes down to three. Backside pressure from Santa Claus and throws for a touchdown at Slaughter. Oh, yeah. What a great save by Cody Carlson. And Webster Slaughter, not been here that long, picks up the change, comes open, and Cody Carlson capitalizes on the turnover. And that percentage we showed you earlier about the Bears and they're allowing points after a turnover just got worse. And then in the first half, of course, the Oilers got their only touchdown in the first half on a Chicago turnover. Look, your Bears fan, it's almost like a car accident. You don't really want to watch it, but you can't get your eyes off it. Now, going to go for the point after. I hope, I hope that's true of everybody else watching this game. We know better. <laughs> 17 to nothing, Oilers. who had started every game this season until last week, loosening up, getting ready to come in when Chicago gets the ball back. If it's uh, if he's not coming in, it's a clear-cut case of wishful thinking. Yep. 17 to nothing, the Oilers lead it. 6.41 to go on the third. Del Greco sends it airborne. Taken at the eight-yard line by Darren Lewis, and a fine tackle is made before... Lewis can get on track by Eddie Robinson, our rookie linebacker. And 
and uh, well, wishful thinking apparently was the case. <laughs> Harbaugh, I, I assume, for loosening up on his own. It's twitched the beer so. <laughs> yeah, it would. Not all that chilly in the dome. Elbow <laughs> drama. Oilers were looking for a Christmas present tonight from the Bears, and they weren't waiting to get it. They took it. Willis stays in the game, and Brad Muster fights his way out to the 21-yard line for a gain of four. We have 6.20 to go in the third quarter. Oilers on top, 17 to nothing, and what is a very vital game for the Oilers in as much as when you look at their schedule, through the balance of the season, Green Bay, a red-hot team, comes here Sunday night. Then Houston has to take its run and shoot into Cleveland. And then in what is shaping up as a uh, very important game on closing night, Buffalo against Houston here. And they left out Cleveland December 21st. Mm -hmm. There is the remaining schedule for the Oilers against three teams with winning records. Second and six. Willis hangs it up there and it's batted by Bubba McDowell. He got a hand on it. The pass intended for the tight end, Kelly Blackwell. When I look at the score, 17 to nothing, I think back to Mike Ditka's parting words to us last night. He said, we will play well tomorrow night, and if we don't turn the ball over, you see how competitive this game will be. Why is it 17 to nothing? Because of two Chicago turnovers. One return for a touchdown, the other a fumble, that resulted in a touchdown, a short Oiler touchdown drive. Take those away, we've got a 3 0 ball game. Here's one for five on third down tonight. Third and six here from the 21 yard line. Shotgun, four receivers, that's Gentry in motion. And that's incomplete. Dishman covering Kozlowski. That's a mismatch. This been one of the better cornerbacks in the league. Kozlowski, a better special teams player than receiver, and of course being forced into action because of injuries. Tom Waddle out. Ron Morris has been out most of the year. Let's take a look. Did he get it there a little early? Just right on schedule. Good play by Dishman. Looked pretty good to me. Gardaki to kick. Wobbly kick. Goes out of bounds at the 40-yard line. And the Oilers will take over at that spot with 527 remaining in the third quarter. The Houston Oilers trying to go 8-5 and five and leading the Bears 17-0. Dome with 527 to go in the third quarter. Oilers on top, 17 to nothing. Love you blue is the theme here. <laughs> they may win the sign award down here in Houston, too. There are more signs decorating the Astrodome than any stadium we've seen so far this year. They are into it tonight. First and 10 from the 39-yard line. Carlson stepping away, buying time. And runs out of bounds up at the 43-yard line. So he uh, turns nothing into a little something. It's a gain of three. He's run out of bounds by Dante Jones. Still, though, that's running by choice. Mm -hmm. Jack Pardee said something out. interesting last night. We talked about Cody Carlson as compared to Warren Moon. He said, well, he's been sitting on the bench. He's only had, what, eight starts over the course of five years. And he has been sitting in the meetings and listening to everything we do, getting ready to play, and seldom ever playing. And if he has one little problem, or he's had one little problem, that's trying to, when he gets in there, trying to make the big play, trying to make something happen on every play. And you just saw Cody Carlson has learned. He didn't try to make something happen there. He just maintained the ball, no turnover. Falcons the following week. As play resumes, it was an injury timeout. Dante Jones mildly shaken up, out for the moment. Three-yard pickup at the 42-yard line on second and seven. The catch is oh, made wow. by Duncan. Curtis stays inbounds, first down at the 40-yard line. Oh, right, Duncan's having a great year, and that was a tremendous effort. And there you see one of the injured bears nursing a little bit of an ice bag. That was 
Dante Jones, the heir apparent to the middle linebacking spot of Mike Singletary, and he has a sore knee, but what a great catch by Curtis Duncan. Dante Jones, been waiting in the wings for a long time, five years, for this man to say, that's enough. At the 39-yard line. First and 10, it's given to motion. Here's Lorenzo White, closing out on the 1,000-yard mark, picks up a yard, maybe two. Steve McMichael makes the tackle, and uh, that's 72 yards total tonight for Lorenzo White, so he is eight shy of 1,000. Lorenzo White, remember they had Rozier here, and they had Alonzo Highsmith here, and they had Alan Pinkett here, and they had a lot of running backs, and then they finally decided, hey, this is our man. And now it's White and White alone. And as he responded, Dan touched on it a while ago. He's not only a gifted runner, one of the best around. Good receiver out of the backfield, particularly in this offensive scheme. Perfect with the screen. Second and nine, and Perry makes his presence felt. The other thing White does is he brings a little punch to the table. I mean, he delivers a blow when he runs. He's not a receiver. He is not a, a running back that, that goes in a line of scrimmage looking to dart around people. And, and one of those guys that is just looking for an avenue pointed towards the sideline. Lorenzo White would just as soon run over someone. And there's a look at his receiving prowess. The last five games. Games he's tied for the NFL lead. And you know, there's a little 41 coming in tonight. Those dump offs and screens, but they are very, very effective when you have far four wide receivers and and you're covering and concentrating on those four wideouts. He gets open so often. Second and five at the 34 yard line. Carlson. Complete. That is uh, Duncan again for a uh, very short gain. That's Curtis's sixth catch of the night. And Richard Dent extremely unhappy that he didn't get to the quarterback, and he was pretty blatantly held. Kevin Donnelly, the left tackle in on this series, and he take a look at Donnelly there. Now watch Dent's going to beat him around the corner, and that's that's holding. That's impeding his progress towards the quarterback, and Dent comes right up and complains. Dale Hammer didn't see it, or he would have called it. Roper is no longer in and left in. They had brought in Tim Ryan. Third and one at the 30-yard line. Gibbons in motion. White stays in the block. And it's incomplete. Slaughter reaching for it inside the 10. Carrier covering on the play. And it will be fourth and one. Here's a look at Don Maggs. Now Del Greco coming on. Not the most popular Houston Oiler around. Well, Del Greco missed two vital kicks over the past uh, few weeks. One could have given them a win in Pittsburgh. The other could have given them a win in Miami. You guys remember the fake field goal that Al Del Greco ran in Phoenix when we were out there to watch... The Cardinals mm -hmm. play the Cowboys. I think I was back in 88. It's a 48-yard attempt that turns into be a fake and a heart. Well, that, that's Should it kind of a reliable of what we saw in 1988. Oh, I don't know about that. There's a 17 to nothing lead. The only way you can get yourself hurt is to either turn it over or do something like this. Hmm. 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 <laughs> I don't know whether that was by design because there's no one out in front of it, did it? And we were being told that he bobbled it. Kenny Wolf, our producer, looking at the screen. Well, There's no way the ball could be That's what it placed. is. Well, that's encouraging that that wasn't a fake field exactly. goal. Exactly. That was a... I feel a, better for Jack yeah, Hardy. Yeah, me. <laughs> Montgomery just had trouble handling the snap. It looked to be a good snap. And we'll see if the Bears, who've been impotent all night offensively, are able to capitalize. We'll take back those four. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. We, how do you retract the... Hmm? On first down, it's incomplete at the 25-yard line intended for Keith Jennings to tight end. But we were very judicious there, not jumping the gut. We were, we were pondering that fake field goal and, and getting ready to leap all over it. The signs of maturity and wisdom. <laughs> and not knowing what was going on. Or lunacy. <laughs> Jack Part, it seems like a thousand years ago, but Pardee was the head coach of the Chicago Bears in 75, 76, 77. 
in 77. He took him to the playoffs for the first time in 14 years. And what was his reward? He got canned. Oh, well, they got beat. <laughs> I'm just waiting for him to coach the Houston Rockets. <laughs> the only thing in Houston he hasn't coached yet. He's done a and great the Astros. job. Where, he's done a great job wherever he's been. Uh, second and ten. And Willis gets sacked at the 35-yard line. Busting in is the outside linebacker, Rick Raff. Former Miami Dolphin picked up on plan B and has worked out well for them because we earlier talked about Lamar Lathan going down with that fractured bone on his leg. Graf has turned in a pretty good performance. Here he comes on the blitz. Up to the left side of your screen. Peter Tom Willis, meanwhile, is four out of 13, and there's a little face mask that went undetected. <laughs> P.T. Willis, four out of 13 for 38 yards on third and 19 from the 36-yard line. From the gun, he steps up to avoid Fuller. And then the pass is incomplete, but we've got a flag as Dishman is all over Kozlowski. And I think they're going to call that Kozlowski. Going for the ball, Dishman got there early. Dishman is either going to the sidelines That's because he's hurt or he's going to hide, one or the other. Dishman just took off for the sideline after the play. It's all in the timing, and he kind of a flutter ball, and he got in there a little earlier than he anticipated. And keeps it alive for the Bears. Kozlowski again seeing a lot of playing time tonight because of the fact that Tom Waddle is on the sideline. Hooks him here a little bit with the right arm. Slows him up a little bit. Works him with the left arm. It's just about everything you can do. Then falls on. 20-yard penalty. At the 45-yard line, he floats one perfectly into the arms of Darren Lewis. And on one pass, he gains about as much yardage as he had thrown for in almost three quarters. Rick Graff with the coverage. Well, that's and a good you touch. Called yeah, it the touch. coverage. There's a, there it is. Graff, a 250-pound linebacker, is incapable of covering someone as speedy as Darren Lewis one-on-one -on -one out of the backfield. And, and that is a yeah. That, that's just a good example of uh, you got to give Willis credit. He found the best matchup he could find on the field in Lewis on Graff and got him the ball. Yeah, that's a great touch to over Graff. Floated it in there and. Also, Lewis, good concentration, staying in bounds. 30-yard gain from the 14. Now Lewis on the ground takes it to the 11-yard line. So a penalty and a 30-yard gain, and all of a sudden Chicago scrambling to get back into the game with a minute 10 to go in the third quarter. And if the Bears get into the end zone here, all of a sudden everyone in the Astrodome is a... Uh, the tension quotient goes up a bit. Remember the numbers we gave you earlier about the Bears' ineffectiveness when they got inside the 20 and throwing the football. They got themselves now in a second long situation where they should put it in the air. Again, they are without their clutch receiver, Tom Waddle. He's on the bench without a really fine receiving tight end. Those are the people you need in this situation. On second and seven, here comes the blitz, and look out, down he goes, Eddie Robinson, and nobody was there to block him. Eddie Robinson, a great story, a walk-on at Alabama State, an academic All-American. You only have one back in the block, that's Neil Anderson, and two linebackers are in the middle. They so seldom blitz, Dan, you don't anticipate it. You take a look, Muster's the only one rather staying in the block, not Anderson, but there were two linebackers in the middle. He steps to Al Smith's side, and nobody accounts for Robinson. Lewis is released to go into the pattern. That's you almost be, wonder if Muster should look the other way. Got to be Muster's man. Yeah. He, at least got to be aware of him. You're looking right at him. Yeah, it looked like Al Smith was accounted for by the offensive lineman. And another mistake for the Bears. End of the third quarter, 17 to nothing, Houston. And we'll return with Monday Night Football after this word for ABC6. Astrodome in Houston as we start the fourth quarter. Now Michaels, Frank Gifford, Dan Deardorff, 17 to nothing. The Oilers lead it, and Chicago trying to get back in the game. Third down, 13 at the Oiler 18-yard line. Peter Tom Willis from the shotgun. Throws over the middle to Neil Anderson, and Neil Anderson in for the touchdown. 
Hussein like he did and has done so often, breaking tackles, but like he did against Cleveland to temporarily get the Bears back into that game on a pass from P.T. Willis after they had fallen behind. Bears dodged a bullet there, too. They got the touchdown. They could have been flagged for holding, too. A fortunate turn of events. Willis stands in there. He had Jones coming from the other side, and for the second time, Frank, on this drive, he demonstrates nice touch in throwing it to a back out of the backfield. Butler for the point after. Neil Anderson scoring his ninth touchdown of the year, five of them on pass receptions. Let's take a look at the missed holding call here. That's Stan Thomas on the left side working against Sean Jones. Hooked him pretty good, but P.T. still got a touchdown pass and the Bears in the game. Is here and uh, on the right of your screen is Bud Adams, who not only is the owner of the uh, the Oilers, but is the founder of this uh, team. This team uh, born in 1960 when the American Football League came into existence, and uh, Bud Adams in his 33 years is the proprietor of the Houston Oilers. Major Fester in Houston in the sports area for getting this arena built, and the commissioner in town to meet with an advisory group of players to discuss many things. One of them. Of course, being should there be extra protection worn, and in light of what happened, a lot of injuries this year. Chris Gardaki's kickoff is seven yards deep, and uh, just for a second, Pat Coleman thought about coming out, and Spencer Tillman said, "Whoa, well, Nelly." Also, a wide discussion of what <laughs> possible rules could be installed by this advisory board. That was just a discussion here this afternoon. Well, the Oilers will have it at the 20-yard line. The Oilers are uh, one of those teams that has never been to a Super Bowl. We talked about Adams founding this team. They're one of the founders of the AFL and owning it since its inception. The Oilers won the first ever AFL championship in 1960, beat the then Los Angeles Chargers in the AFL championship game. With the general manager, Don Posterman. He came along a little bit later. A little later, but he... Was one of the principal architects of the merger. He started signing NFL stars and veterans. First down, Cody Carlson from the 20, throwing, and that's another catch. Curtis Duncan tonight has made seven catches. He has 68 catches this season, and he is closing in on a, on a very strange record. Most receptions in a season by a wide receiver without scoring a touchdown. Ray Berry holds the record. The great Ray Berry, the Hall of Famer Ray Berry, who caught 75 on season without getting into the end zone. Those, those are Duncan's marks coming into the game tonight. Plus seven now, and, 68 for the year. And that's a personal best for him. His previous best was 66. Second and two at the 28-yard line. Gibbons in motion. Here's Lorenzo White. Picking up two yards. It's very close to a first down. It's going to give him 74 for the game, and he's six shy of 1,000 for the year. And if they put the nose of the ball on the 30-yard line, it's a first down. Otherwise, it's going to be a critical third down coming up here for a key, and they don't put the nose on the 30, so it's third and that much. Alonzo Spellman was in the game. He's starting to see some time in there for the Bears. Their number one draft choice. Rookie out of Ohio State. And he and the refrigerator are manning the middle. Their defense trying to dig in. Big play for them. Third and inches. And Carlson submarines across the 30 to convert. First down, Houston with 13.25 to play. Twice now, Kevin Gilbride, the offensive coordinator, has, has resorted to that quarterback sneak. And Carlson pulling it off very easily for the first down. One of the things you have to take away if you are in your short yardage defense is that. The quarterback sneak. First and ten, Oilers at the 31. Houston leading 17-7. to And the Oilers now trying to take as much time off the clock as they can. They snap it with a play clock at three. Carlson goes deep, has a wide open Jeffries inside the 30. Tackled at the 23 yard line by Donnell Wolford. Dan, you said he's also very good. And this was perfectly timed out between Cody Carlson and Haywood Jeffries. They were doubling him. Stinson underneath. They were picking him up deep. 
and Carlson hit him right between the two defenders, and then Jeffries did the rest. There he is beyond Stenson in front of the man who should have picked him up. That's David Tate, number 49, and, and Tate was so deep and so far to the inside of the field that he was not only late in coming over to make the play on Jeffries, but then he missed the tackle as well. It's a two-deep zone where the deep outside there belonged to David Tate. He didn't get there in time. 46-yard pickup. First down at the 24. Here is Lorenzo White. And Lorenzo White takes it to the 16-yard line, and he is over 1,000. The crowd doesn't realize it yet. I would assume they put something up on the board in a moment or two. But Lorenzo White has just gone into four figures. And, that and was, there it is to the moment. He that might not realize it either, but he knows he's very close. Now he knows. They just announced it. The PA announced it. Just told the crowd. And he can go back and thank his right guard, Doug Dawson, for that one. He's the recipient of some sensational blocking. And, of course, when he gets in beyond that line of scrimmage, then it's all Lorenzo White, and he's got a lot to give. And I tell you, any back that makes 1,000 yards is a recipient of some good blocking. Second and two, here he is. Picking up the first down, taking it to the 11-yard line, and tacking on about six more. Oh, and Singletary's trying to pick a fight with Bruce, Bruce Matthews. Bruce is saying, hey, well, hey, we've been around too long for that. Nice yeah, I, think, I think Mike's claiming that he was held and you know, some bumping and shoving and frustration certainly very high with the Chicago Bears. And who can blame them? Right? Anybody that could be in their predicament and be anything less than really upset about it isn't much of a competitor. First and 10 at the 11-yard line, 10.25 to play. Houston leading by 10. End around, inside gives to Slaughter. Webster Slaughter out of bounds at the one-yard line. Donnell Wolford saving the touchdown for the moment. Now this time it was Trace Armstrong who got caught inside following the fake. He was in there for Roper defensively on this play. He got himself caught inside, and the reverse came wide around him and came close to six. Other Tim Ryan, number 99. Trace, of course, on the sidelines, not even in uniform. But Ryan got caught inside, as we've seen Roper on several occasions tonight. There's this, Ryan. This is what I love about the run and shoot. They're on the one yard line, they got four wide receivers. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you don't have a tight end. First and goal, and Lorenzo White dives in for the touchdown. Well, fitting that he got the touchdown. Why not get the touchdown on the drive where he also got 1,000 yards? And look for the Oilers in the Rose Bowl later this year. <laughs> Good drive by the Oilers in answer to the Bears' touchdown. Well, the Bears had gotten back into the game, and then the Houston Oilers marched down the field, and they go 80 yards. Oh, you blew. Just over the top. And more surge up front. Yep, that's it. More good blocking. That was some series by the Houston offensive line. Del Greco converts. They're rocking at the goal. 940 left to the fourth. 24 to 7 on Houston Oilers leading the Chicago Bears 24 to 7 with 940 remaining in the fourth quarter. Al Del Greco to kick off for the Oilers after they go 80 yards on the heels of a Chicago touchdown. Taken at the eight-yard line, Darren Lewis, a busy man tonight, brings it back out to the 24. Dicka sends Willis back in with the first play, and we can tell you that coming up Saturday on ABC Sports, the Senior Tour grand finale. There's Lee Trevino in your picture. Ray Floyd in the tournament. Chi-Chi Rodriguez goes home to Puerto Rico for the Senior Tour beginning at 4 o'clock Eastern time. And then we go to Joe Robbie Stadium next Monday night where the Los Angeles Raiders still alive in the playoff scramble after yesterday's win against Kansas City. Go on the road to take on the Miami Dolphins. 
Dan Marino and company. That's next Monday night. Buffalo losing. They are back in, definitely back in for a hunt for that division title. First down from the 24-yard line. Willis throws underneath to Brad Muster. He gets popped at the 30-yard line after a gain of six. Tackled by Al Smith. Unfortunately, Miami not able to take advantage of Buffalo losing as they were pummeled pretty good by the 49ers. Less than 100 yards passing for the night for PT. Mm. Equal numbers of touchdowns and interceptions. And Jim Harbaugh, who fully expected to play tonight, and we were expecting him too, Mike Ditka telling us yesterday that he definitely would play, and he's not seen any action yet. And we're almost halfway through the fourth quarter. Second and three, with a scrambling, gets corralled, gets sacked. Lee Williams, the longtime San Diego Charger who came over last year. Well, he's playing just about as much as anyone along that defensive line, too. He doesn't start, but he can play inside. He can play outside. He'd probably like to line up a defensive end and stay there where he had so many great years with the Chargers. But the Oilers are using him and using him well. And relief along the line of all of the four positions. Third and five at the 29-yard line for the Bears. And Morgan shaken up. A great effort by Morgan to get by Jerry Gray. There was a lot of bumping going on on the sidelines and a good strong arm by Willis to let Morgan run under it. Morgan the fastest of the Bears receivers. That's not saying a whole lot, but he has got great speed like so many of the wide receivers we've seen from Tennessee. But watch 21. That's Jerry Gray with a little late bump. Now a little left arm. Morgan stays on stride, and Willis is right in there with it. Jerry Gray, I think, thought that he was going to take a lot more out of Morgan with that little... That was a, a veteran play by Gray, and I think he fully expected to knock Morgan off stride, and he whipped. I mean, he got barely a piece of Anthony Morgan and, and paid a stiff price for it. Morgan comes out. Kozlowski in for him. Jim Eddy, the defensive coordinator. The Bears have a first and ten at the 15-yard line. Pressure. Willis, after escaping from Soldier's flag down, hit Foster for a very short game. We might have two separate calls here, guys. One came in from the sideline, and then one came from deep in the secondary. And you've got offsetting. That's interference. Radiated the offense. Holding number 95 in the defense. Penalties offset. Repeat first down. William Fuller on the Houston side and Lynn Kozlowski on the Chicago side. Koz has been pretty busy tonight. He has. <laughs> he's been in the midst of a lot of things. Bottom right, there's Fuller. And he just <laughs> horse collars Brad Muster as he tries to get out of the backfield. That's the... That brings Fuller, one flag. What was Fuller doing there to begin with? Well, he was dropping off, and a lot of times in a defensive responsibility, especially when there's a blitz up the middle, you'll have a defensive end uh, responsible for taking a little something out of an intended receiver, but you can't just blatantly hold him like that. He was almost back in the safety position. Yeah. Paws out, Morgan back in. That's Morgan in motion. There's a fake sweep and a little walk to pass into the arms of Brad Muster. There's a flag down, however, at the 22-yard line. And the reason he was open is that uh, I believe it's no play. Illegal motion, number 81, five yards. And that's why he was that open. Anthony Morgan. I think Morgan might have been going towards the line of scrimmage at the snap of the ball. You are allowed to be in motion, needlessly to say, but watch Anthony Morgan as he starts towards the line at the snap of the ball. And I, he was barely moving towards the snap, towards the line rather, at the snap. But <laughs> other than that, it was a pretty well executed play by the Bears for absolutely nothing. Let's try it again, would you say? 
you got to keep going parallel to the line. Well, Kozlowski's penalty kept him from an automatic first down on Fuller's hold, and now that penalty caused him a touchdown. First and 15, and his arm is coming oh, forward. It's an incomplete pass as William Fuller broke up the play. And his PT's just upset. Rolled over for a minute like he was hurt. I'm not so sure that he's not hurt. Ooh, here comes Harbaugh. Oh, and he's waving Harbaugh off. Willis upset that Mike Ditka is sending in Harbaugh. PT is PO'd. And he's not very concerned, I don't think. Not about what PT is thinking. Second and 15 at the 20. I don't think we'll see a recreation of uh, Jerry Glanville. Oh, and there's Harbaugh getting sacked at the 22-yard line by Childress. New quarterback and same result. PT started to go back in on his own. I, I think he will go back in. Yeah, here he goes. Yeah. Well, he... Mike Ditka making a determination that PT Willis is okay, pulls him out of the game, and sends him back in. So well, he did what he did also say to us last night, Dan Ditka that he might send him in with a play. I don't think he was going to send him in under those circumstances. No, I, I, that's almost, I think, a case where he they were just trying to ascertain that, that Willis was okay to continue. Third and 17 at the 22. 24-7 Houston. 6-23 left in the fourth. Willis stepping up. There's a flag down. Anderson is the intended receiver. There's a marker at the 27-yard line on the far side of the field. Well, well that was the case when Harbaugh had been in there. That might have been close to six points. Well, that, Harbaugh, that, good running quarterback. P.T. Willis, that time, twice now, he's not pulling it down, Dan, when he could have got a first down. You're right on, Frank. I mean, that has to be what's going through his mind. You saw that upset look on his face, uh, wondering to himself, why, why didn't I just take off with the football? A quarterback that doesn't show the... Number 29 of the offense. Penalty's declined. Fourth down. A quarterback that doesn't show the desire to take off with a football up the middle of the field is a quarterback who's going to face defenses <laughs> that are really stacked against him because the middle will be vacant until you challenge the middle of the field. Harbaugh just went in and gave him a play. Yep. That's, what do you call that, a half messenger? Yep. I think you call that something that doesn't make Jim Harbaugh very happy. Fourth and 17. Return to center. Going for the end zone and broken up on a pass intended for Wendell Davis. Steve Jackson, number 24. That's it away. Mm. So the Oilers hold with 6.07 to play in regulation and a 17-point Oiler lead. bench with a team that's about ready to uh, go down to defeat for the sixth consecutive time. You work so hard and you have so little to show for it. Easy to see why they look and feel the way they do. From the 22-yard line, Lorenzo White takes it after the 30-yard line. That's a gain of eight. And you'll see some serious working on the clock. Uh, part of Houston. And I don't often do this, but I got a message from a guy named Gary Chapman up the Riverstone Farms in Franklin, Tennessee, and I've heard of unusual Monday night football parties that they go out on the river, hook up a generator, put up a fake screen, and the good old boys get it on and watch Monday night football. So we just wanted to say hi to them. On the river. Having a good time. Out on the river. Taking a generator. It's got to be a little chilly up there this time of year. Mm -hmm. The good old boys are there. Good for them. What are the rivers frozen? They didn't feel it, these good old boys. They watch hockey. A second and two, here's Lorenzo White. Whoa! He gets banged down as he reaches the line of scrimmage <laughs> by Lemuel Stinson, the a kid who grew up here in Houston. And the smallest man on the field. You do not often see Lorenzo White going backwards <laughs> after he's been running with the ball. <laughs> A uh, highlight film for Lemuel Stinson, and he looked up at the scoreboard to watch this. 170 pounds out of Texas Tech. A couple of knee operations. He brings it all to the field every time he comes out there. 
Third and two at the 30-yard line. That made Ditka's night. There is White. This is it. Tackled by Carrier at the point of big game. There goes the night. Yeah. I think he forgot the distance hit already. Get the feeling that Ditka's looking at this group of bears that he has this year and wondering why he doesn't have a Butkus or why he doesn't have a, a Bill George, why he doesn't have a Doug Atkins, and quite frankly, why he doesn't have somebody like himself that can just grab a hold of the team and shake himself and can go up in somebody's face and say, we got to do better than this. And using a few more adjectives. He's so frustrated. But they're not there. At the 50-yard line, first and 10. <laughs> memories are great. Yeah. But memories don't knock anybody down. And they don't catch passes and they don't throw passes. Man. The Chicago Bears, their biggest problem isn't Mike Ditka. It is simply that most of the teams that they're playing in the National Football League have more talent than they do. It's that simple. And part of it comes from being on top for so long. They draft them very late. Total yards tonight. Oilers now gaining Chicago to this point by 97. And leading by 17 on the scoreboard. Second and nine. And Cody Carlson is going to put it up. And the catch is a juggling one made by Curtis Duncan. He's a little short of the first down. Duncan's big night continues. And, and Duncan and Singletary. Like saying, come on, man, I'm retiring in three weeks. Think the uh, competitive fires still don't burn deep in the belly of Mike Singletary? Yeah. Don't bet on it. And what a way to leave. Yeah. The man's already announced that he's going to retire at the end of the year, and... It's almost not fair that he has to leave the league on a team that has a losing record. He deserves better than that. Third and six. The play clock is down to five. The game clock is down to 210. Duncan tonight has caught eight passes. And Carlson drops the football and recovers to maintain possession at the 50-yard line. And a little bit more pushy shovey. the Hollywood term for fighting. Yes. And we are going to come up to the, or down to, the two-minute warning. Be warned. A brace of minutos to go. Oilers, 24. Fair <laughs> seven. A brace, a brace of minutos. For those of you listening, sound New jalapeno important. peppers coming up. To the Bears' safety. His dad, James, is in a hospital in Hampton, Virginia, and about ready to undergo a procedure this week. And Sean asked us to, to send his very best and the Bears' very best to Papa James back in Hampton, Virginia. You know, we were talking to Mike Singletary last night about some of the guys who will not necessarily pick up the physical slack, but the emotional slack defensively for him. And the first guy he mentioned was Sean Gale. Montgomery to putt with two minutes to play. And a fair catch is called for by Danelle Wolford at the 12 yard line. The Bears will get it at that spot with 152 remaining. But one of the problems for the. Excuse me, Dan. One of the punt, that punt was one of the reasons he's one of the best in the league. And one of the problems, though, with Chicago is, you know, when Mike says something like that, Al, about Sean Gale, is that, you know, next year it's going to be Gale's 10th year in the league. I mean, he's not a kid. The, the, the thing with the Bears is they have a tremendous group of older players. Guys like Dent and Singletary and McMichael and on down the line, Van Horn, so many quality players. And then it seems that they have some youth. And needless to say, question marks surround the youth. But what's lacking on the Bears is that real quality in the middle years. They don't have a lot of tremendous football players in that six, seven, eight, nine year range. And those are the guys that carry your team. And real leadership, too, Dan. You look down there and you say, who's picking this team up? I can tell you who's laying down. <laughs> Once again, the Chicago quarterback. I think the most interesting game of the season for the Bears is going to be their 17th. 
It's called the postseason. Yeah. And They're not on the field. Off the field. And the number one issue that has to be resolved is the future of the head coach. Right. Who said, as we said at the top of the show, he intends to come back next year. He'd go into the last year of his contract. The decision, of course, ultimately rests with Michael McCaskey, the president of the team. And when we remember when we were in Chicago a month ago, Michael McCaskey said, he said, I want Mike Ditka to be enthusiastic enough to want to come back to coach this team next year. And some people, I think, misinterpreted that. To frame it correctly, my interpretation was McCaskey, he was concerned about Ditka, but he wanted Mike to have the verve as Morgan makes the catch and the enthusiasm and the will and the want to come back. Because it's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen next year. This is a football team that the rebuilding process is going to take a couple of years. It may take three years. It could happen in two. But this is not an overnight fix on this football team. And whomever is going to take on the challenge better be prepared to stick with it for a while because it's going to take some time. Veteran player uh, Dan talking about the veteran Steve McMichael and as we said before Dipka said he's probably playing the best football of all this year. Here's Wendell Davis making the catch up to the 39 yard line with 47 seconds remaining. Well, that's a shame when when performances and efforts like that are, are lost in a losing year. When the, when the team loses it all becomes irrelevant as far as individual performances are concerned. I wonder how much better New England would have been over the past 12 years if they yeah. hadn't cut him loose. And Steve McMichael. McMichael. At the 45-yard line. You know, in the equal time provision here, we spent a lot of time talking about the Bears. The Bears are a, a great team for national television with Ditka and all the rest. But meanwhile, the Houston Oilers tonight, as we take a look at the credits, are winning a game they had to win. Jack O'Hara, the executive producer. Kenny Wolfart, illustrious producer. Craig Janoff, our director. And the rest of the gang, Joe Chavo, with no knuckle jobs again. Every button perfectly pushed. Ben Harvey, the halftime producers, Dick, Emily, and Nancy. Fred King and Mitch Green. And that pass is Picked off at the 15-yard line by Chris Dixman. Intended for Kozlowski. For the Oilers, as you've mentioned, lying ahead. Green Bay, they'll play them here. Then they have to go to Cleveland. And we continue with our credits. Steve Hurd, our director of information. And up in the booth, as always, George Hill of Everywhere. And oh. Malibu Kelly, he's <laughs> our spotter. Chris Dishman. There's a new celebration yeah. uh, demonstration. The dish man. Kissing his, kissing his fingertips. Yeah. And the Oilers <laughs> will close out with Buffalo right here and looking for trying to get that top rated wild card so they could get the home game. They're so much better here in the dome than they are on the road. And remember, the man on the left there, Warren Moon, is coming back. We saw one uh, of the dishman's other fingertips, you'll recall, on Thanksgiving Day in Detroit. As the Oilers won a. You care to elaborate on that? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> As the Oilers won a most important road game, the clock stopped at 18 seconds with a change of possession. And a kneel down will end it. The Bears have lost six in a row. The Oilers have regrouped. The Oilers try to get hot down the stretch. The Oilers are very much in the wild card race. It's the Cody Carlson just doing enough again to lead him to a win. 24 to 7, the final from Houston, and we'll return right after this.